The Mac Mini has always been a pretty good deal for churches, but Apple just made the best one yet, and honestly, it's not even close. The new M4 Mac Mini is smaller than ever, more powerful than ever, and it comes in at such an amazingly low price that I kind of think it's a no-brainer for any church looking for a good production machine. I've been playing around with this one for a while, and I've got a lot of thoughts about it. I'll show you the crazy concurrent workload I ran on it a little bit later in this video, but first, let's kind of just talk through the hardware and the specs that you actually get if you were to buy one of these new M4 Mac Minis. So let's start with the outside of it. This thing is tiny, even smaller than the previous Mac Minis. It's 5 by 12.7 by 12.7 centimeters. And for those of us in America who don't know the metric system because um, that's crazy, that's basically 2 by 5 by 5 inches. So again, this thing is tiny. I mean, I mean, look at it. Like, it, it's a tiny little square, tiny little box. This will fit on any desk whatsoever. So on the box, right here on the front, you get two USB-C ports. Now, these are not the highest speed ports, but these are perfect for kind of peripherals like a mouse and a keyboard or maybe some flash drives for some quick file transfers. It's not gonna be your high speed ones that you'll use for displays or maybe an SSD that you have hooked onto it, but more on that later. You also have a headphone headset jack if you need it. Now, using this as a production machine, I would always recommend you don't actually use the headphone jack for any kind of sound output, but it's good to know it's there. If we flip around to the back here, You've just got a power input, and this takes a pretty standard power cable that you can get anywhere, but one comes in the box with the Mac Mini. Next up, you have the Ethernet port, and by default, the base model actually supports up to gigabit Ethernet, so that's 1,000 megabits per second. That's gonna be good for pretty good speeds, but if you have a high-speed network and maybe high-speed storage servers on that network, um, maybe you need to spring for the 10 gig option, but most people will be fine with the one gig. Next up, you have the HDMI port, and that's gonna be good for your main display that you are using to actually control the machine. And then three Thunderbolt 4 ports. Now, Thunderbolt 4 supports up to 40 gigabit per second transfers. That's pretty fast. If you get the M4 Pro model, which I don't actually suggest that you do, more on that later, um, that'll actually be Thunderbolt 5 ports. But again, I don't think that most people actually need that for what you're gonna be doing with it in a church setting. Now, the Mac Mini actually supports up to three displays, two 6K displays and one 5K display. That's a lot of Ks. Realistically, that's gonna be three 4K displays or three 1080p displays. Whatever it is that you're actually running with it, it's gonna handle it. Finally, if we keep looking, here on the bottom, you actually have the fan, both the intake and the exhaust. Now, Apple's done some pretty creative things with this fan design, and this thing, it stays pretty cool, and it doesn't get that loud, so um, honestly, it's pretty fantastic. And finally, here on the bottom is the power button in the corner here. There's been a lot of people complaining about this because when it's sitting on the table, you pretty much cannot reach that power button unless you have the skinniest little fingers of all time. However, that's not really that big of an issue because realistically, you shouldn't be using that button all that often anyway. And there's already some third-party accessories that you can 3D print or buy to help you press that button a little bit more easily in the off chance that you actually need to use it. People are kind of blowing that out of proportion like they do with Apple products. So you can see, I mean, it's got basically all the ports that you really need on a production computer. You know, it would be nice if we had some USB-A ports, but it's the year 2024. That's just not an option anymore. An SD card slot would also be nice, but again, as a production computer, it's not necessarily as important. If you were gonna use this as maybe an editing machine, maybe I would miss that, but as it stands, uh, you know, you win some, you lose some. So that's the outside of the machine. Let's take a look at what's actually inside of this. Now, I'm gonna be talking specifically about the base model because as I mentioned before, it's really the only one that I actually recommend you buy. And I'll talk more about the specifics on why that is later, but just keep that in mind, any of these specs are purely for the base, base, base model of this M4 Mac Mini. Now, as the name suggests, you have the new Apple M4 chip on the inside, and that's going to be a 10-core CPU and 10-core GPU on that chip. Those numbers realistically don't mean anything to anybody, just know newer and more cores make it go fast. Honestly, it's a great chip. It blows any kind of workload out of the water super fast. If you're still rocking uh, maybe one of the really old Mac minis or an old laptop that still has an Intel chip and you somehow missed M1, 2, 3, and now 4, seriously, it's hard to describe how much faster these are than the old Intel chips. If you have something with an Intel chip in it, seriously, try your best to upgrade to one of these new Apple silicons. This is just a total aside. They're so good, they're so fast, and the efficiency you get from them, just honestly, 
trust me, it, it's worth it. Now, next up is RAM. This guy comes with 16 gigabytes of memory inside, and that's up from the old baseline of eight gigs. Apple has actually updated their entire line to start out with 16 gigs now in preparation for all of the new Apple intelligence features. Now, whether that is going to be something that's good for us or not, I mean, that stands to be seen, but what is good for us is that we're not paying more and we are getting more RAM, so that's awesome. And finally, this base model comes with a 256 gigabyte SSD, which is not a lot in the year 2024. I've seen some of y'all's pro presenter media assets. I've seen how big they are. Don't lie to me, you don't delete things. That 256 gigs is gonna get eaten up real quick. So we'll talk about that in a little bit here. So that's the machine. In the words of Han Solo, it may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts, kid. Now, because this is a desktop computer and not a laptop like the MacBook Air or MacBook Pros of the world, you are gonna need to buy some extra peripherals to go along with this in order to actually use it. Now, the three most important are obviously your mouse, keyboard, and monitor. That's going to bring you right up to par with a laptop as far as actual functionality. Now, for your mouse and keyboard, you could get wireless versions that work over Bluetooth, and then you don't need to worry about any kind of cables, but if you don't wanna to have to charge devices, you will need, yes, a dongle to plug things into. Because this is a permanent installation, I kinda of find that that doesn't matter that much. You plug a dongle in the back, you plug in your mouse and keyboard, great, you're good to go forever and you never even notice it. But if you really just hate that, great, you don't need to get something Bluetooth. And then as far as a monitor goes, they even have a full-size HDMI port on the back. So you don't even need any kind of weird cables, you just plug right into it. Now, when I tested it out, I just used some cheap Logitech stuff I had lying around to plug into it, but honestly, it's kind of whatever it is you want to plug into it. That's kind of the beauty of a desktop is you can customize it to your heart's content to be exactly what you want it to be. If you want to use Apple's Magic Keyboard and Mouse, awesome, go for it. If you want to use your fancy mechanical keyboard and your MX Master 3 because you're a power user, awesome, that's your prerogative as well. So once you've got your peripherals plugged in, you power this thing on, and the first thing that you'll notice is that this thing is pretty much silent. I mean, obviously it's got a fan in it and it will spin up under heavier loads, but honestly, I never really noticed it above any kind of ambient noise and this thing never got hot. I mean, it's literally was sitting in front of my vent that was blowing hot air out and I'm pretty sure that air from the air conditioning was hotter than this computer ever got. So that's fantastic to see. You won't really ever notice this thing even when it's working hard. Speaking of working hard, what did I actually do to test this thing and make sure that it's going to be good for a church's production use? Well, most churches are running things like ProPresenter or Spotify or Logic or ATEM Software Control or Lightkey or OBS or you name it, software like that. What if I told you this could run all of those things actively working all at the same time and honestly not even break a sweat? Because that's what I did with it. Specifically, I had OBS up and running doing a screen recording of my entire monitor and streaming that to YouTube at 1080p 30. I ran it for 24 hours straight, and although it dropped a few frames here and there, that's pretty unavoidable, it was still few enough that it was 0.0% of my frames, and the entire stream was going up to YouTube just fine with no stutters, no problems at all. Next, I also had Logic running in the background, doing some playback of a 32-channel multi-track recording that I had. This was running through some EQs, compressors, and some basic plugins, so nothing too heavy, but again, 32 channels of playback happening here. I also had ProPresenter up and running with our full library from Church, running two full displays with 4K video displaying on both of those, as well as two windowed outputs on the computer itself. Now, that's a new feature of ProPresenter, and honestly, I don't really know the performance implications of those windowed outputs. It may not be that big of a deal, but they were there. For some extra stuff, I also had Spotify streaming music that entire time. My Spotify wrap this year is gonna be wild, just gonna be 24 hours of nonstop Sabrina Carpenter, so you're welcome, Sabrina. I also had light key up and running with a pretty decent sized scene up with a handful of lights all moving. And then also Chrome was up with a few tabs open, mostly just streaming that YouTube stream in the YouTube studio. As far as stats go, we never even got above 30% CPU utilization and the RAM capped out at about 75% use. So about 12 gigs being actively used. So that's where you see that upgrade to 16 gigs really coming into play we're able to use all of that RAM and that memory to keep things running nice and smooth without getting capped out at eight gigs. And again, during all of that, this thing maybe got a little warm to the touch, but not even uncomfortably so. I mean, I could keep my hand on it, no problem. It wasn't loud, I didn't notice any noise coming from it, and everything just ran super smoothly, kept working like a champ. 
Now, obviously in a real production setting, I wouldn't be running all of those things at once. It would be hard to control all of the individual apps, not to mention different audio sources that I'd have to map, but it kind of proves the point of, hey, if you're using it for any one of these things or even a couple of them together, like this guy can handle it. Now, that's probably true of the older generations of Mac mini as well with the M2, M3 chips, but with the new M4 and the new 16 gigs of RAM, not to mention the new form factor, I mean, this guy is just purpose built for this. So I keep mentioning the awesome cost of this machine, but I haven't actually said what it is. And I've also kind of been ignoring the fact that, you know, laptops exist and why do we need to get a desktop in the year 2024? Isn't that kind of what the dinosaurs used to compute on? Well, as far as the laptop versus desktop argument, this is gonna be sitting in your tech booth and probably pretty much never moving. I think it makes sense to have a desktop computer. One, you get to have separate peripherals that you can set up however you like. You can have a bigger screen, a dedicated mouse, and you can get some of this off of the table so you actually can create more space in your tech booth. Not to mention the bigger chassis actually will help with performance as it will help with the heat dissipation. Now, obviously, as we discussed before, you're gonna have to buy a few more things, the mouse, keyboard, monitor, etc., in order to actually make this useful more than just a box that's running in the background. But those things really don't add up to all that much. So the final cost, I'm gonna read it off here, this Mac mini, $600. A mouse and keyboard, the basic ones I was using, $15. A USB dongle that you can plug into, $19. A 24 inch 1080p high refresh rate monitor, $75. And honestly, you should probably just look on Facebook Marketplace for a monitor because you can find them super dirt cheap if you're really on a tight budget. But we're buying this new on Amazon for the sake of argument. So with all of that together, we're looking at $710 to get us to the equivalent package of a laptop. You've got a screen, a mouse keyboard, and you know, the computer itself. But if we actually compare it to the cheapest laptop you can buy from Apple, that's going to be the M2 MacBook Air. And that's still a thousand dollars. So not only is it 40% more expensive, it's also got a two generation old processor in it. As far as price goes, this is kind of no competition here. Obviously that price is pretty variable. You could buy a better mouse and keyboard. You could buy a bigger monitor. You could buy whatever you want to use with this thing. But you're still gonna have to buy quite a bit in order to get up to that $1,000 mark of a worse laptop. So you can see why I'm talking about this being kind of the budget king as far as church production computers go. But if we look at the specs, Apple gives you the option to upgrade your RAM or upgrade your storage. I mean, should we do that? If we look at the RAM specifically, I'm gonna say just right off the bat, no, absolutely not, we shouldn't do it. Again, I threw all of these different workloads at it all at the same time, and we never even got above 12 gigs of usage on that RAM. With that being the new starting point, I just don't think it makes sense to pay $200 for every eight gigs of extra RAM you're gonna get. I don't think you're gonna see any real boost to productivity and performance for the types of workloads you're gonna be doing on it in a church production environment. So stay away from RAM upgrades. Storage gets a little bit more interesting. That 256 gig base model is really just not a lot in 2024. I mean, video files are huge, but just like the RAM, you're paying $200 for every upgrade. We're talking every extra 250 gigs, you're paying an extra $200 on top of it. That means if you upgraded this guy to a terabyte of storage, you could almost buy another Mac mini. That just seems crazy, right? And there's a way that you can get a terabyte of storage on it without having to pay out the nose for it. And that's with external SSDs. Now, hear me out. You have to make sure that you're buying ones that actually have really fast read and write speeds. So the one I was using when I tested this was the Crucial X8 SSD. And actually, I don't even think they sell that anymore. It looks like it's just the X9 now when I looked it up, but you can get a terabyte SSD for a hundred bucks. That brings our total cost of this build to $810. And now we've actually got 1.2 terabytes of storage. And when I was doing all of these tests, all of my multi-track audio and all of my ProPresenter assets were actually stored and being read off of that SSD which tells me that the speeds that it's given me through these back Thunderbolt ports is plenty fast enough for whatever we need for this church production environment. So all of a sudden this 256 gigs of storage doesn't seem quite so limiting anymore if you're really just storing your operating system and then the applications themselves. If you're not storing any files on it, you really have as much space as you need to and you can expand it as much as you need to in the future. So with that being said, I mean, all in all, I really just think this is the best computer for churches of honestly all size to be using in their tech booth, whether you're buying one of these to run a lot of things or you're buying an individual one for each piece of your pie, at the price, you really can't go wrong. And look, before somebody jumps in the comments and types out a mean comment about how I'm an Apple shill and Apple's not that great and blah, 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 right behind me is my custom built gaming Windows PC. Right here is my Google Pixel phone. Like 
I'm no super fan of Apple, but I gotta give them props when they make something great, and honestly, this is great. So, rather than calling me an Apple shill in the comments, jump down there and let me know what you would use this for and how many you're buying for your church, and if there's something cool about it that you're excited for that I didn't even talk about. And then, if you're interested in more content like this, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I'm trying to put out more videos and more that's not even just related to live streaming, but all sorts of production and IT tech in the church world. Anyway, thanks for watching. Until next time.